kaua me siia tiksub veel, siis juhatan sisse meie järgmise esita, kelleks on Aleksander Noorta, Tallinna tehnik ülikoolist, tõetab seal teaduina, siin teatmik ütleb seda nii ja siis eks and I will switch to English, I hope you will understand it. And maybe Alexander will introduce him. Yes, yes. Yeah, because he knows. Yes. But I will say in Estonia that see kord nettekanne käsitleb majanduslikku ärimudeli loomist ee ühiskonnas. The long, the long title, I don't think I need to explain that. So, but yeah, work to Alexander. But I have now no display. Or is that being switched to? I don't see, I don't see the display. I mean, from from here. Okay, okay. Strina, that's it. Aga. Do I have to do something special? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. We have to use. We have to use this kind of methods. I use Linux usually, so. Okay. But now it's okay, yeah. Right. So, yeah. My name is Alex Norta. And I'm currently at uh, Tallinn University of Technology, at the Department of Informatics. And I came here to, to Estonia a year and a half ago uh, from Finland, but I'm, I'm not Finnish. But I, I, I thought, uh, so I was at the University of Helsinki, then I was at the University of Oulu. And in Oulu, it gets very cold and dark and depressing, so I thought I have to go back down south again. And so I ended up in, uh, in, in Tallinn. And my PhD I got from uh, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And <coughs> um, the presentation I will give today is based on a journal paper. And I don't expect you now to read the journal paper, but I just uh, want to say this paper just got accepted into the Journal of Internet Service Applications into a special issue for uh, service composition for the future internet. <coughs> and um, I will try uh, to keep the presentation fairly high level and conceptual uh, so that it meets basically a broad audience. And it's more or less something I presented already. Does it work? Oh, OK. <coughs> that I presented already at the uh, CoinFest uh, event in, in Tallinn. So I will just repeat that uh, presentation uh, but now with the kind of the journal back paper in the backing. So, okay, let me, let me just stop the, uh, where's the mouse? Ah, here. It's so we'll try to crank up my uh, presentation. Yeah, you... Wait. Uh, on the big screen, then it's okay. Yes. Start from the beginning. <coughs> And I had, um, I was kind of in a dilemma, so maybe I should start telling about the background. And uh, first, I would like to ask who uh, took part in the blockchain workshop or uh, Bitcoin workshop. One person, okay. Uh, two, two, okay, good. And who does not know what Bitcoins are? Oh, okay. So it's basically a form of electronic currency, essentially. Uh, who knows what is blockchain technology? I thought so. One person, and um, it was actually quite good. We had some nice chats uh, yesterday about the positive or not so positive uh, aspects of it. But <clears throat> um, I was in a dilemma when I did my PhD once upon a time in, in Eindhoven. Uh, I came up with these uh, ideas about cross-organizational collaboration automation using back then service on the computing, now it would be cloud computing. <coughs> and um, I was always something missing. Uh, so this was part of an EU project, but uh, somehow um, um, after the project uh, uh, was finished and my defense was finished and I continued with the research, I realized there's something missing. And um, actually very recently I realized uh, what, what it was or at least uh, what, what now comes in very handy to sell my work from back then now in a, in a better way. And it, this was really this blockchain technology. When, so just as a, as a small explanation, when we talk about the blockchain, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, that's basically part of, of, of 
what people usually know as Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a blockchain, which is something like a you know, heavy distributed uh, transaction machinery. And, um, and on top is a protocol layer uh, where you can program things, not in Bitcoin, but in other solutions that are upcoming, like Ethereum. Uh, no need to, to know much about it now, but <clears throat> what uh, happened basically was that uh, suddenly uh, my work about cross-organizational collaboration and contracts, automating contracts into so-called smart contracts, suddenly became feasible. And um, it's not that I had that realization myself, so I, I just invented somehow this smart contracting technology in 2007, I mean earlier, but uh, suddenly I heard from the blockchain community them talking about distributed autonomous organizations and uh, uh, blockchain technology being useful for electronic or let's say smart contracts. And that's where uh, I became quite excited and uh, immediately took some, some chapter from my old PhD thesis and converted it into the paper and this presentation kind of. So <clears throat> in my presentation, um, what's going to happen is uh, I basically share it. Uh, there's some link I realized uh, <coughs> that's missing. Basically here the smart contract should link to the journal paper just in case somebody's interested. So, so you have the preprint. And otherwise I just have a lot of links. Uh, this is the link to my website. So I'm all over. It's very easy to, uh, to contact me. <coughs> okay, so the agenda. I will give you an introduction to the topic of uh, smart contracting and uh, then more or less uh, give, tie, try to tie that uh, into the current state of the art of, of this blockchain tech cryptocurrency um, development. And so the gaps and research questions. Uh, and <clears throat> in a way, it's, a, it's quite an interesting situation because uh, this idea from the blockchain community to now drive smart contracts it's happening kind of in a bottom-up way. And when you look at what they understand to be smart contracts, it's basically coding, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you are a business person, this is not quite enough. Uh, you will not, as some manager who tries to set up a business collaboration, uh, get down to the coding level and code a smart contract. Maybe <clears throat> for certain, yeah, it's already happening for, for financial domains, but in principle, there should be something like a tool where you kind of drag and drop elements and then you bring them together and you basically uh, build up your contract that way. And that maps now down in the next stage uh, to some sort of maybe XML um, uh, um, representation of this visual contract. And uh, that gets mapped then down to some machi uh, um, uh, machinery that uh, enacts basically the contract. And there you can then include something like uh, Ethereum, maybe, uh, or basically uh, use this, um, these coding parts, uh, which now the blockchain community is coming up with. So I saw that uh, that's, that's uh, how it happens uh, from a bottom-up way from, from the, <coughs> from the crypto, cryptocurrency blockchain tech guys. And I came in from the top. So what I basically did was, um, Back in my PhD thesis, I looked at uh, business collaboration models, which I will also present here, and uh, I kind of developed in a top-down way <coughs> an ontology uh, for the properties uh, of a contract. So an ontology is essentially concepts and properties that meaningfully relate to each other. It's a kind of a form of knowledge engineering. And um, that I use uh, in a further step to perform some suitability explorations and explo uh, expressiveness e explorations that are mapped then to this language called e-sourcing markup language, which is a contracting language. Uh, at this stage expressed in XML. Uh, so who knows what is XML? Okay. <clears throat> no, it's basically a bunch, it, it's basically, um, how should I say, I can't think of a definition. Anyone knows a definition that's handy for XML? Yeah, yeah, okay, but, um, okay, yes, it's a markup language. Uh, but the thing is, um, uh, it's basically then machine readable. You can feed it into some, some application and it, underst it understands uh, the markups and then carries out some tags. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, as, as always you can 
Google for it uh, to, to know more. <clears throat> so that's kind of my feasibility evaluation. And my idea is basically that I really um, use this ESML to, on the one hand side, map it onto um, these um, coding elements that's, uh, that are on top of blockchain for the smart contracts. But on the other hand, on the top, uh, and that's also still work to do, uh, open issue, um, builds uh, some, some sort of easy to use contracting modeling uh, device, uh, uh, sorry, application. So you could think of using something like Enterprise Architect, which is a very nice pre-existing uh, uh, system uh, where you can build a plugin uh, to then just you, you know use drag and drop elements to 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 basically uh, uh, build very quickly your your contracts. <coughs> okay. So I realized the internet is unfortunately not entirely as fast as I, as I would have wished for, but I will just uh, <coughs> walk you through uh, some observations that are made, and. Um, when, when, when I get excited about uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, then I'm not really interested in, in the alleged moneyness feature of that. Uh, so I've, I think it's very nice that, it's <coughs> that cryptocurrencies uh, come up as uh, basically competition to the centrally bank, central bank issued fiat currencies, which I think are weaponized and, and not good for society. So I think uh, it's my personal personal, um, maybe wishful thinking that these cryptocurrencies will establish a more honest um, financial system. Let's see if that's going to happen. But what I'm, what I'm actually much more interested in is, is the, the socio-technical implications of, of this new technology. <clears throat> On the one hand, very obviously it allows, uh, it, it, well, it directly attacks the established uh, financial monetary system. That's one thing. <clears throat> it also attacks, um, it attacks uh, government as such. So basically what, what is possible now is to build our do-it-yourself governance platforms. And there's something, uh, it's basically a startup company um, <clears throat> called BitNation, um, I think, .io. And um, uh, it was very funny. So at, at TTU, we're trying to, or some of my colleagues, they think they want to do research into um, kind of getting this e-residency program on, on track and or getting this um, um, basically e-Estonia platform going in the clouds. Uh, but that's all on top of this um, uh, X-Road technology, which at this stage is maybe legacy. Um, so you might have heard of a fellow called Tavi Kotka, who ran around and very successfully advertised this e-residency program, <clears throat> and it created a lot of um, a lot of uh, interest. The problem now is that um, the e-residency people unfortunately don't know what to do with it. There are a lot of issues with changing the laws. There are a lot of issues with uh, <clears throat> fi fi figuring out what the um, what the uh, ecosystem is uh, of, of this uh, e-residency program, what services there are and, and whatnot. And there's actually not a single company, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that has showed up so far to make any suggestion how to realize this e-residency program. Alternatively, a Swede, uh, Susanne Tarkovsky, uh, <clears throat> started this BitNation platform. And uh, it's essentially an open source um, yeah, governance as a service platform that's built on top of Ethereum and uh, that basically allows you to run an ecosystem of blockchains, several multiple blockchains that exchange with each other. And thereby you can, you can basically create uh, a, te a territory independent governance ecosystem. So what that really means is that we're entering a stage of digital, anar digital anarchy uh, potentially that is enabled by this blockchain technology and these cryptocurrencies. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is going to hit, uh, hit us pretty hard. So the, uh, anyone who follows uh, what's going on sees that uh, um, the bankers are on the run already, uh, governments feeling threatened, uh, individuals are more empowered by it potentially. Now it's all, it's all still emerging, okay? So um, 
uh, it's, it's technology in the making, uh, but I think it's one of, one of the most important, maybe, innovations of the last hundreds of years. So, <coughs> uh, the problem with Bitcoin is, uh, there are two things. First of all, Bitcoins are very slow to use. I think they're actually impractical for every, everyday transactions, uh, let's say, in the shop. It's too slow. Uh, and also, they, um, they, the, the protocol layer is underdeveloped, so you cannot program the Bitcoins. And um, that leads into problems, for example, like uh, if you pay something and it ends up with the wrong recipient, <coughs> then you cannot um, get that money wired back so easily. You have to contact that person and agree, uh, okay, please send me that back, so, so it's a bit of an issue. But alternatively, um, um, a currency emerged, which is called UltraCoins. And <coughs> it uh, was, to the best of my knowledge, the first coin type that actually uh, started to develop this protocol layer with um, Turing complete uh, language. So um, suddenly, it became possible to uh, program contracts on top of the money. So you get smart money. And uh, so the fellow who pushes these ultra coins is uh, called uh, Reggie Middleton. And he's quite often on, on YouTube's, uh, YouTube interviews. And he's in New York uh, with the financial, you know, part of the financial um, industry. And <clears throat> he's already starting to compete with uh, hedge funds and banks and um, all sorts of traders who at this stage still get uh, a lot of bonus for just shoving some, some financial products around. And uh, that's actually irrelevant. Uh, the existence is basically irrelevant. So you can fully replace them uh, with uh, more or less using these uh, ultra coins. Uh, another thing is uh, what, what this technology is doing is it more or less limits or, or, or severely attacks the established uh, uh, legal profession, lawyers. Lawyers and bankers more or less become, and the government become more or less obsolete. Um, um, so let's take the example of a notary. So you have some documents and uh, <coughs> you need maybe some, some legal uh, proof of, uh, of, of, of validity or existence. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but um, um, I know when I, when I moved around from different countries at times, I had to have some sort of documents uh, stamped and approved by, by a lawyer that, okay, they are legally acceptable. And it's very cumbersome, takes a lot of time, and, um, and yeah, it's expensive. Alternatively, you could uh, use such a service like proof of existence. So what happens is you take a document, <coughs> push it into the proofofexistence.com uh, web service, and it uh, basically performs a cryptographic digest. <coughs> and out comes uh, a large number, uh, which basically is uniquely tied to a particular state of, the doc of, of a document. So if you just change one single bit of the document, then the number that comes out of the cryptographic digest is totally different. Uh, and actually, <clears throat> uh, so that way uh, you can make a proof of existence. So very recently, um, um, somebody actually used this type of technology to develop a blockchain-based uh, passport. So passports are actually, well, uh, I think, uh, I mean, to me personally, there were some, some very s silly instruments of control uh, issued by the state for coercive reasons uh, to keep us somehow on, on the plantation. Uh, alternatively, <coughs> you could use blockchain technology to already, in a very legally strong way, issue your own identifications. And this actually, if you just go to YouTube and type in blockchain ID, you get a one-hour video about how um, um, the first uh, blockchain uh, passport, blockchain-based passport, was created. <coughs> now, this proof of existence, actually what I did uh, with this paper I showed you in the beginning, the journal paper, it's a preprint, uh, just to show you another way how you can use this technology. And uh, the editors of the journal, to my opinion, did a very bad, bad job with the editing. And I couldn't convince them that it's a bad job and they will go ahead now anyhow and publish my paper. 
But the paper I have here is the one I approve of. <clears throat> and I want to make sure when I send this paper out now uh, to other parties uh, that it remains in, in, in the preprint state as it is. So what I did was basically, uh, um, there's another service that I used uh, called bitproof.io. So I just once again performed a digital digest. And I have now a version uh, that uh, allows me uh, basically to make sure that when I send my document out, uh, I always have a checking mechanism uh, to, to make sure the state of this document remains frozen as it is and nobody can just manipulate it on a way and, and, and mess it up. <coughs> so, more or less, <coughs> um, the algorithms ever more become the law. Uh, the blockchain takes over ever more functions that uh, lawyers uh, used to perform. Uh, the financial system can be abolished, uh, the government uh, is on the run. And also what uh, <clears throat> certainly blockchains uh, enable with uh, smart contracts is um, a change in business. Um, um, they enable essentially uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that can loosely uh, collaborate with each other, but still in a, in a trust in a, in a, in a trust enforced way and in, in a way uh, um, of, of non-repudiation. So this is uh, potentially quite interesting uh, because it uh, directly also attacks the uh, centrally planned corporatism uh, system, which is currently the business mainstream, okay? And we can <coughs> uh, potentially move um, once again back uh, to, to uh, a way of doing business which adheres much more to free market economics principles, the way how it actually should be without all that centrally planned corporatism that we have at the moment. So, <clears throat> um, the blockchain changes the contract law. Uh, there are already some, some existing solutions, I mean, um, like low-level solutions. Uh, one is Bitalo as a lightweight smart contracting option. There's a white paper I linked to. <coughs> the, the, more <clears throat> the heavier version is called Ethereum. Uh, for smart contracting, also here uh, I add a white paper, and the fellow who actually leads this entire Ethereum initiative is called Vitaly Buterin, and he's 21 years old, and he just won a very prestigious uh, networking prize, where uh, he beat uh, actually uh, Zuckerberg for Facebook. So. Um, the other thing, uh, so once we say, okay, we have, we have this option to, to do smart contracts and we enter a world of free market economics, then we need to have platforms where we can actually meet each other and, and contract. So <clears throat> what's also coming up uh, very strongly is uh, escrows uh, for uh, tendering and positioning uh, requests for quotes and, and price and whatnot and, and uh, surfing uh, basically as a platform for, uh, for setting up uh, business collaborations between decentralized autonomous organizations. So you could say this, this escrows, uh, by the way, that's uh, quite a nice uh, startup uh, idea uh, to push. And actually I'm trying to do that uh, with another person at the moment for a company in Germany to build such an escrow uh, for uh, trading software as a service. Um, yes, and it all culminates essentially in what I told at the beginning, that we can now build our own BitNation platforms <coughs> as a governance 2.0 option outside of the uh, existing status paradigm. So uh, on BitNation we can basically register ourselves. Uh, we can freely choose uh, which BitNations we want to, to join. It's possible since it's an open source project just like Linux. It's possible to fork uh, your own version and depending on whatever type of sets of values uh, you want to shape uh, a, a BitNation governance platform, you can do that and then offer it and uh, then hopefully attract um, people who want to register, in other words, become citizens, and then consume from there all sorts of services, maybe for uh, maybe insurances, um, healthcare, um, education, 
uh, some uh, blockchain powered uh, documentation like blockchain ID stuff <clears throat> and so forth and that's actually something which more innovative people or, or uh, let's say more free thinking people of the Estonian e-residency program uh, they're actually considering putting this on top of XROAD as a governance as a service platform and uh, based on my knowledge actually LHV Bank of Estonia uh, they forked a version and in the mectory of, of, uh, of TTU they set up uh, more or less a lab uh, experimenting with uh, BitNation uh, for a governance as a service platforms on which they would like to trade their financial services as a start and then basically keep it open uh, so that also other companies uh, can basically offer their services through such a platform. So this is kind of the long-winded introduction story. Uh, but once again, this is all happening kind of in a bottom-up way uh, based on this invention of this uh, fellow Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, nobody has ever seen him, nobody knows who he is, so he's some sort of code word uh, for a much larger group, I would say, of uh, people who uh, did the, the research. I mean, it's, uh, it seems it's quite academically driven, it appears uh, to be in the background. Uh, so the question is what to do on top of, um, of, uh, of bit, bit nation and e you know, how to use e-contracting and, and these new collaboration models. And <clears throat> what I'm doing now is basically I take all my old research from the last 10 plus years and I map it all onto this new technology. That's at least what I'm trying to do. So what is completely missing is basically this entire service ecosystem management toolkit on top of a bit nation and just recently actually last year I published this uh, this uh, journal paper um, which uh, precisely um, specifies uh, such 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 a toolkit uh, the thing is uh, this when, when I worked on this paper um, I was still not aware of smart contracts and I was not aware of bit nation or at least not sufficiently that I would have uh, referenced any of, of, of that. But it's quite clear how this would map onto this uh, blockchain stuff. So <coughs> conceptually, I just want to uh, once again uh, go a bit into detail what, what it now means to have decentralized autonomous organizations emerge. Okay? So here on the top left, or maybe I should use uh, the pointer. We have uh, a typical organizational representation of the current paradigm. Centrally planned corporatism, okay, has nothing to do with free market economics or capitalism. Capitalism is something else than centrally planned corporatism, just to point it out. But what do you have here? You have basically a bunch of uh, silos, uh, departments, some silo owners, uh, some sort of middle management, and then some chiefs on top with... Uh, <clears throat> with uh, advisors and more or less uh, the entire society is pyramidically organized. Um, now, as some of you might read occasionally what goes on in the economy and basically we are heading for the next big collapse. And it has a lot to do with this pyramidic setup of how we think we have to do business. Cent centrally planned corporatism. It has never worked in history. And we will probably know in September, October, see once again, when we collapse again, that it doesn't work. Maybe this time they learn the lesson. But uh, <clears throat> this is more or less uh, what happens um, very conceptually when you move towards decentralized autonomous organizations. So you get rid of the silos, you cut out the middle management, and you basically install process orientation. So then you have basically very lean and agile flows of value towards the customer who is somewhere here. And the chiefs are only there to monitor more or less the context and then uh, state which types of processes have to change, in what way do we need new processes or do we need to eliminate some out of the set. <coughs> Once you have um, such an orientation, you basically get e streams of flows you have companies that connect uh, the, the processes cross-organizationally and you get uh, very um, um, efficient and agile flows of value. Um, these uh, processes you can then deposit in hubs 
uh, or escrows, as I called them on the previous uh, slides. Uh, and it allows uh, basically companies to set up, to find each other there and to set up collaborations. And this you can all run in the cloud. Who knows cloud computing? Cloud? No. It's very easy. It's basically a bunch of servers and software that run, that are addressable via TCP IP. Okay? So you do it already all the time. You have your Facebooks and all your, I mean, your social media, and you have some sort of cloud drive and uh, all that stuff. Uh, so it's somewhere, and to use it, you have some sort of mobile device, and it hooks you up to super, super computing power in the cloud. <coughs> and the cloud is organized according to such a stack. So you have uh, here, let, I call it the technical stacks, uh, things as a service. Who knows 3D printers? Okay. Basically, uh, in the future, the idea is that everybody has a printer at home and you can print just about anything you want. You can print parts, you can, <coughs> um, you can print a gun, you can print uh, tools, uh, whatever you want, okay? You just get the open source blueprint and you print it. That's 3D printing, that's potentially a revolution in production. You have uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, so here's uh, all your servers, here's maybe, uh, yeah, here's some sort of cloud uh, operating system, some Azure maybe. And here, this is where it gets interesting with the business semantics. Here you have your software as a service, and here on top you have your business process as a service, which basically means, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> you can uh, automate these processes in clouds. So in other words, what, what it really means for a company, you can throw your entire legacy system in the most extreme case out, out of the company. You can, you can get rid of your system administrators you, if, if, if you trust the cloud, okay? You can outsource everything. The only thing you have to understand is your flows, your, your process flows, and you need to have uh, some sort of device that hooks you up via the internet <coughs> to the cloud platform. So you get these very decentralized autonomous organizations that basically hook up in these ecosystems of value flows. Okay, so I'll skip this uh, through very quickly, but this is more for academic needs. You need to have some sort of gap that you find and the research question. I'll just sum it up. <coughs> there are some so-called choreography languages which uh, were developed by techies and they don't really ever look at how business people work. So you get languages for choreography that are basically unusable. Same with the blockchain uh, people who say, okay, we now can do smart contracting. <clears throat> yes, in a way it's possible, but it basically means that you are coding, and maybe in Java or C++ or so. Also not quite useful for, for business people. So the question is how to systematically a language for cross socio-technical and contract-based system collaboration specifications. And uh, now, this is more or less the storyline. <coughs> so, in the beginning, I, I first looked at how business collaboration works. So, okay, let's ignore this picture to the right. But this is more or less the traditional centrally planned corporatism model. Very pyramidically organized, very centralizing, power centralizing <coughs> in the top. You have the original equipment manufacturer. Here's some sort of process. There's parts that get outsourced and they're being filled basically by suppliers uh, who uh, uh, plug themselves in, preferably in a business process oriented way. Lawyers don't like that because they prefer conflict during enactment so that they can make a lot of money out of it. <coughs> if you adopt proper uh, process oriented uh, ways of, of basically doing business, then you can just uh, take a lot of the conflict situation out of your collaboration scenarios right uh, during the setup phase. But this is a larger story uh, which uh, I will not get into in full detail. The other part which is more exciting uh, is in the traditional way you have so-called clusters of small medium-sized enterprises. They have by themselves meaningless services but when they plug themselves together they can build a service or basically create a service that suddenly becomes interesting for a high level service consumer to consume who's then 
himself once again a supplier to an original equipment manufacturer. <clears throat> so let's say you build a truck and this is how it would work. Let's say MIN with its suppliers and this is maybe the upper Austrian automobile cluster. Uh, and these were the concrete uh, industry partners of my research project that funded my PhD thesis once. <clears throat> But now, this is much more interesting because we're going to the point of decentralized autonomous organizations, right? So, to cut this long story short, um, the way the small and medium-sized enterprises work in a cluster <coughs> to collaborate in a peer-to-peer -peer way, this is more or less the model for decentralized autonomous organizations. And what you have is basically a business network model with service types into which service offers can be plugged in. And they are back then <clears throat> inside of uh, service providers by larger in-house processes. So, uh, <coughs> basically the contract comes into existence here on this external layer. Okay, so in the case of, uh, of, um, of a pyramidically organized uh, uh, collaboration, this would be your original equipment manufacturer and this would be your suppliers <clears throat> and here the contract would come into existence because of process views that need to match. In the peer-to-peer -peer case of decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, what is the original equipment uh, manufacturer is replaced by so-called business network model with that, that is some sort of blueprint and <clears throat> um, the contract basically spans these two parts and uh, yeah this uh, and and allows basically after negotiation process uh, the companies to to become part of a, of an e-community of decentralized autonomous organizations so i did an ontological uh, analysis um, <coughs> um, first of the so-called suitability um, features of an e-contracting language. Uh, what I did was basically I, I used uh, OWL, which is an, on, um, an on ontology language, and I used Protégé uh, to design with OWL this ont ontology, which I then checked, uh, formally checked, with uh, this reasoner called Hermit, which uses a new set of mathematics so uh, complex ontologies that you build in OWL used to take uh, quite long, I mean if it's a bit more complex, uh, to, to, to check with reasoners. And this Hermit tool, so I just provide the links, you can click on it yourself and uh, take a look. Uh, it's fully published, it comes out of the uh, University of Oxford. Now checks <coughs> uh, ontologies in seconds uh, while it used to take a couple of minutes uh, earlier with other reasoners. So this is more or less what I used uh, to, to, to develop an ontology, which I, I, I kind of uh, uh, depict here, just the, <clears throat> the top <clears throat> ontological uh, concepts and properties. So I used an interrogative approach. I asked who, what, and where, basically, as core ontological frameworks uh, for developing this e-sourcing markup language. So for the who concept, you have uh, company info that can be a party and uh, mediators of, of several parties and they form contracts <coughs> and uh, basically a mediator can serve uh, several parties that engage in, in, in a contract. <coughs> um, there's company info, uh, basically that's tied into a, a variable section uh, the, there's company data, company contact data. So in a real life contract, it's important to clearly identify the contracting parties. So here already is uh, an option to use uh, blockchain technology because here you can tie in a blockchain ID. <coughs> and during setup time, uh, when you use an escrow, you can basically use a uh, a brand new, in, in, in principle, that's something I discovered only two days ago, uh, there's a variant of Bitcoin called NEM. So NEM stands for New e Economic Model. Basically, it's a Bitcoin <coughs> that um, employs 
um, a trust and a mathematical trust and reputation model that comes out of the University of Stanford <clears throat> to basically assign a currency. So trust and reputation that way becomes a, a currency in itself which you can use during the setup phase of, um, of, of, um, of an e-community uh, using electronic contracting. Uh, also, um, within, well, the parties, they have resources and they operate within a certain context. <coughs> the, where, the where concepts. So, uh, you have the context provisions. Uh, there are several sections involved. There's a process section, as, as I told you before. Uh, uh, the parties that collaborate are process aware. So they use process view to basically set up <coughs> their contractual collaborations. So in other words, the process views become parts of the contract and they're backed up in-house by larger in-house um, uh, processes that are extensions of the process views. So that way <coughs> you can basically protect your business secrets. Um, Okay, so part of the context is the legal context. Let's say you have a case law, Anglo-Saxon case law versus uh, maybe Roman law, Ro uh, like continental European law. You have certain business context provisions, um, maybe some additional regulations that uh, a certain cluster agrees or, or a certain industry segment agrees to some other contextual provisions, and all of that goes into the formation of a contract. <coughs> so the what section, or the what concept, so the, con the contract is in the middle, and here we have exchanged values. So the assumption is that uh, we have certain services that are on offer, and you could, on the one hand side, maybe assume there's a sort of a barter situation going on where you have a service being traded for another service, or alternatively, you could trade a service for a financial reward. reward. This, could your, this could be, of course, on the one hand, your old school weaponized uh, central, central banking issued uh, fiat currencies, like the euro or the dollar. But if you want to have a more honest um, system, you could consider here, of course, uh, all sorts of uh, cryptocurrencies. Dark coins, uh, bitcoins, light coins, whatever coins. You can pick out of, I don't know how many are there, 500 or something by now. I'm sure many of them will not make it, but anyhow. And then you have additional exchange provisions. Um, <clears throat> there, once again, you move into further details about the process section. Uh, so important is um, here that um, you create basically um, additional constructs of monitoring that are important for... Um, for the enactment phase. So <clears throat> you don't want to monitor everything that goes on with your collaborating counterparties. There's maybe just certain parts which are of interest. Uh, some parts are either are not inter of interest or your counterparty does not want to let you peep in. <coughs> uh, is there some water somewhere? It doesn't matter. Well. Okay, another, another important, so of course you need variables and rules. Uh, so rules you combine uh, with uh, the process parts. Uh, <clears throat> one option is that you use the rules for, uh, for um, um, defining uh, conditions uh, that determine which paths of a process you take, let's say if you have an or split. And then uh, there are extra snippet sections. So I further explored that in a pattern-based approach, which I published about. Uh, so basically, these pattern explorations, I will not go into detail. Here's uh, the publication. Here's the free PDF. Uh, so you can take a look at that yourself. Uh, and these patterns are um, meaningful uh, for setting up cross-organizational e-contracting configurations. That's all I, I want to say about it. So it's about monitorability. I raised that already before. Contractual visibility. Uh, patterns, basically, that allow you to protect your privacies. And controlment patterns for uh, data exchange. <coughs> so um, 
for the expressiveness, so uh, expressiveness basically means you need to back it all up by mathematics, okay? And that's what I did here. Uh, more or less uh, this kind of ontological and pattern-based suitability exploration so that I capture all the, the concepts and properties relevant for cross-organizational collaboration. It's important to, uh, to give it semantics. So you give it semantics through mathematics. <coughs> uh, why is that important? Because you need to have clarity about what you, uh, what, what you define. If you have no semantics, then nobody knows what stuff means, then uh, you define something, uh, a collaboration, and I understand it in one way, and somebody else understands it in a different way. Also, when I have, let's say, uh, technology to enact, um, uh, uh, to, to enact uh, a collaboration, it's important that, um, that different systems enact collaborations in a way so that it yields the same type of um, of behavior, okay? So that's more or less what I did here. And it all culminates in this e-sourcing markup language, which is basically this e-contracting language which, which, can, which can be used in this, uh, no, uh, in this, uh, oh, thank you, in, in, in this uh, e-sourcing um, uh, architecture. And just very quickly, this is kind of the setup of ESML. <coughs> so I have it fully published on the internet. So here you see it's an e-contract, here's the who, here's the where, here's the what, basically reflecting in XML tags uh, these properties I told you about earlier. This is then um, basically the, um, the toolkit, the, an architecture of this toolkit which, uh, which I also published about <clears throat> and which could be implemented on top of a BitNation governance as a service platform. So, okay, I'll skip that through also because I think my time's up soon, right? Yes. So here's still a kind of a life cycle for e-contracting. And this is kind of an architecture for this escrow uh, that I also talked about earlier. Again, I have the paper, it's published. I presented it in Silicon Valley and you can just download it and read it yourself. So <clears throat> that's more or less it and uh, wow. On the mark. So just to, to to wrap it up, to wrap it up. So um, this ESML, uh, it's kind of interesting because, as I <clears throat> as I said, I, I developed a solution, but I couldn't meaningfully map it onto a problem. And I hope now uh, with all this e-contracting uh, technology coming out of this uh, blockchain community, it will be possible to map these uh, results which are kind of academically developed in a top-down way, to map it onto this technology which emerges in a bottom-up way, okay? And thereby, uh, hopefully, <coughs> we'll get kind of a, um, a solutions landscape that will allow to really run this decentralized autonomous organizations, will destroy the established banking system, uh, will compete with uh, the dinosaur government system, and basically reinstate free market economics as we should have it, and uh, allow us to drop centrally planned corporatism. So that's kind of uh, what I'm trying to aim at. I don't know if it will work out. I will try my best. Uh, but um, I think uh, potentially we're heading for a lot of change, socio-technical change, which at least I find quite exciting. And I think in five years from now, we'll live in a reality uh, which by now we probably can't even imagine. So that's all I want to say. So uh, any questions? No questions? <coughs> On Kusimusi? Uh, okay. If we don't have any questions, then we are a bit out of time. Yes. We have to start with Move the next on. section. Yes, yes. So thank you for thank the you presentation. Very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.